Welcome to the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh's Case Notes podcast. Over the next few months, we're going to work our way around the body head to toe, exploring different body parts and organs and their history in a cultural, medical, social sense. We're going to hear from a historian or curator about their work studying these body parts and their history. And we'll finish up each episode by exploring some of the recipes that were developed in history to treat that part of the body. Welcome to this episode of Case Notes. My name is Daisy Cunningham. I am the Heritage Manager at Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. And I'm Olivia Howish, and I'm a newly qualified archivist and I've been volunteering with the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh for about three years. So welcome to today's episode of Case Notes. We are talking about hair. So I've been looking into hair quite a bit in the last few days, and I'm basically going to share some some thoughts with you, Olivia, and and see what you think. The thing that I find really interesting is that there is this sort of uh, bit of a cultural shift, essentially at the time of the Victorians, because there's this shift from wigs being the standard to hair being much more prominent. You know, wigs for various historical reasons sort of go out in the 1700s and then it becomes all about your actual hair. And of course, it being about your hair brings a whole load of concerns like, are you going bald? Do you have dandruff? (laughs) Things that if you're wearing a wig, you don't really have to think about. So it becomes medical really in a way that it hasn't been before. It's amazing the number of things that can allegedly cure baldness, (laughs) according to Victorian advertising. In terms of your hair, one thing that I find fascinating, and I think we still, I suppose we still have this in our society today, is the amount of writing that was done in the 1600s and 1700s around hair colour and the meaning of different hair colours. So it could tell you about the, a person's sort of moral temperament or, or their emotional temperament. But it could also tell you about their medical temperament as well. So there was lots of things written about if you have dark hair, you are more prone to consumption or you're more prone to scrofula. You know, it it was literally your hair colour could determine what type of disease you got, all tied in with humoral theory and and sort of ancient Greek and and early modern ideas about how people got sick. Hair colour was one of the ways in which you know, sickness was brought about. But there's also lots written about how redheads are dangerous, how people with with blonde hair or golden hair are are more jealous. And advice books will be written telling you what hair colour to look for in a partner because that determined the healthiness of your of your marriage. You talked about um the humoral theory. Is it true that Hippocrates had male pattern boldness? I don't know. What I, did I, you read? I, I'm, I'm curious. <laughs> I read that he had male pattern baldness and his concoction that he thought would cure the problem and bring his hair back was a combination of beetroot, horseradish, pigeon droppings, spices and opium. Lovely. Which sounds like a delightful combination, <laughs> but it didn't work. I mean, I'm not massively surprised that it didn't work. <laughs> I'm also not massively surprised to hear pigeon droppings in there because that does seem to be, if all else fails, try some animal, you know, manure, basically, <laughs> seems to be the kind of standard approach to these things. But yes, concern about boldness is, is certainly nothing new. And yeah, I mean, absolutely, the, the range of things that you would use to treat them. I, I sort of love the way I've got now got certain favourite treatments So um, electricity, of course, is a go-to for curing baldness. Spanish fly, I swear, is a treatment for everything. It was used as an aphrodisiac, it was used for blistering, and it was used to restore hair growth, at least according to these sort of Victorian adverts. It's fascinating to me because it's the rise of advertising. So this is in the 19th century, and so it's already happening in the 1700s, this sort of increase of newspaper advertising. But the 1800s is really when it kind of properly gets going because you have these huge adverts, very 
very illustrated, lots of detail. So it's the kind of rise of marketing, but it's also the increased fascination with electricity and the use of electricity. Looking at the Victorian ad advertisements that I was mentioning, one of my personal favourites is this thing called Scott's Electric Hairbrush. It cures dandruff, it prevents baldness, but it also does everything else you can possibly imagine it doing. You know, it cures every disease you can possibly imagine. And then it's got these supposedly magnetised iron rods in the handle, which is where the electricity comes from. It's not electricity, but people didn't really understand really what electricity was, so he could get away with pretending. So there's all these sorts of products like this where they're they're taking advantage of people's fears around boldness. Not that we wouldn't have equivalent things today. I'm sure there are plenty of magical sounding treatments. It's all about argan oil now, isn't it? And Olaplex and things to make your hair smooth and frizz free. It's fascinating looking at the history, how fast a new product or new idea comes in and then just becomes completely normalised. So, you know, for, for much of history, the concept of shampoo, we didn't have that. You know, the concept and the term gets brought over from India. We established it in the sort of late 18th century. And then all of a sudden, everyone sort of gone, well, obviously, we have to shampoo our hair. These are very new concepts um, that normalize incredibly quickly and and again the advertising and the marketing is such a huge part of that have you seen any of the advertising for the opposite so the hair removal there are certainly adverts in the victorian period but the ones that i've seen are the quite early ones spanish fly once again <laughs> um i found a couple of recipes for hair removal that you know were sort of diy you know oh my god some of the things people use for hair removal things that would blister your skin but quite often it's essentially something equivalent to pumice stones for scrubbing the hair from your body i found a really bizarre thing which was that very shortly after x-rays were discovered it was proposed that they would be useful for hair removal. In 1896, the Lancet uh, proposed them as an alternative to shaving your beard. And I think it was in America, they had commercial salons where women would go to get their hair removed. I think it's quite a starlet thing and continued, surprisingly, long after people discovered that x-rays could cause cancer. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that, but I've heard something along similar lines in terms of the, the American salons, because hairdressers for women are a relatively late development, at least in, in the UK, as far as I could tell. Barbers are, are much older, but hairdressers as in a physical space or a shop or, or a salon or whatever, where you go and get your hair done was relatively late because of the fact that wealthy people, upper classes or, or upper middle classes, would have their own hairdresser who would come to their home. It was fine for a man to do a man's role was in a public space. His role was surrounded by other men. But for an upper class woman to go to a, a sort of hairdresser's was was something that took quite a long time to develop. And I think it was quite contentious as an idea. But also, you know, th this is the sort of time we're talking about, which is primarily sort of 1500s, 1600s. Things are so fundamentally different because barbers did all the dirty, messy things that physicians wouldn't want to go near. So yes, they did bloodletting, but they also dealt with pustules, great ulcers, or also they did teeth pulling. So you can imagine how it was dirty. <laughs> it was messy, but it wasn't a place for a lady. Part of the Victorian hair culture and Victorian hair fascination was also the sort of, um, almost the hair worship. It's surprising um, because you usually think about hair work and art created with hair being a Victorian thing, but the story I've got is actually um, from 1716. It was a, a bed sheet that was part of the Museum of London's display on executions last year. And it's the bed sheet of the Earl of Derwentwater, James Radcliffe. And he was awaiting execution for his involvement in the first Jacobite rebellion in 1715. He was in the Tower of London and his wife took the bed sheet from the bed that they may or may not have shared and embroidered on it in human hair. And it says the sheet off my dear, dear Lord's bed in the wretched Tower of London. And when it was given 
to the Museum of London. It said that it was her hair. But when he was beheaded, his heart was taken to an Augustinian convent in Paris. But his body, with his head sewn back on, was given back to his wife. So there is a suggestion that the hair is actually his hair. I think hair is creepy and weird when it's... <laughs> when it's not attached to a human head, yeah. yeah. No, instantly, uh, hair hair is fascinating because it instantly becomes creepy when it's not attached to you. Hair has kind of had a level of fascination for people, I think, because it is both of you and not of you. In the sense that your kidney is absolutely of you. <laughs> your kidney or your heart or the literal organs of your body but hair is part of a person, but it can also be removed and that person will be absolutely fine. And so there's something sort of about that, that, you know, th there's all those Victorian or Edwardian stories in which, you know, a woman gives a man a lock of her hair to remember her by. The logical part of my brain is saying they didn't have photographs. It was a physical reminder of the person that you loved. And yet the creeped out part of my brain is saying that is so odd to have this thing that used to be attached to the person. I guess you can sort of relate it to relics in that way, like a, an honouring and a worshipfulness of things, but it's still odd. But again, it's this sort of Victorian ability to take things to the next level. And so there's a lot of stuff that I've seen, you know, we're kind of looking into this about the memento mori, you know, the lock of hair from the, the recently deceased person that would then be woven into a bracelet or a necklace or what have you. And part of the problem with that was it became so popular. So it's, 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 it wasn't something that they invented, but they popularized it to such an extent that there was a whole industry around it. So whereas perhaps previously it would be done on an individual personal level, you know, you would send off your hair to an address that you'd got out of a newspaper advert and they would make it into something and send it back to you. And there was this increasing concern by people that perhaps they were walking around wearing a necklace of some random other person. In, in terms of what you were saying about it sort of creeping you out, we've got a Victorian sort of memento mori hair bracelet in our collections. And you'd think initially from looking at it that it's just the sort of locket on the front, which obviously has a piece of hair in it which doesn't bother me particularly until I realised that the whole band of it was made from woven hair. So it would be against your skin. And something about that unsettles me more. Very tricky to keep that clean. But I think, I think for me, it's the, the, the level of intricacy of some of them. Again, you know, especially during the, the Victorian period, because you start getting actual catalogues. You know, these are all the things that we can do with the hair of your loved one for you. These sort of very glossy, brochures, I suppose. I saw one that claimed to be a tradition for a hair wreath. So it would be a horseshoe shaped wreath that every time someone in the family or the community passed away, they would take a lock of hair and make it into a new flower. And then that would be put at the center of the wreath and everything would get sort of pushed outwards. The only other things I've got are um, more recipes. Apparently Julius Caesar was Going bald and Cleopatra said, put bear grease, horse teeth and ground up mice on your head. Um, <laughs> to be honest, at least they're put, the, the good thing about these sort of baldness cures yeah. is that usually, not always, but usually at least that you're putting it on you rather than in you. Yeah. And so the worst ones for, for other things <clears throat> are the ones where you get all of the sort of, you know, excrement and things like that and it's like drink it every morning in a you know with your yeah. breakfast sort of thing so at least it's only going on your skin mm -hmm. it could be uh, yeah yeah they weren't poisoning themselves in theory they were just making themselves smell foul in our case study today we're going to look at wigs and especially the wigs of the French king Louis XIV. In the second half of the 1600s, Louis, also known as Louis the Great and the Sun King, was known for his opulent clothing, with many trying to emulate his style, from his shoes to his hair. Anyone who couldn't grow naturally long and thick hair like Louis would wear a wig to imitate his aesthetic. But once Louis himself began to lose his hair, he came up with an alternative. It took hair from half a dozen or more people to make just one of Louis's wigs, and the king owned many wigs with different styles for different social and regal occasions, with the best wig hair being believed to come from women who lived in the country. Preparing Louis's wigs in the style which he became associated with involved the use of rollers, then greasing them, then powder and finally perfume. 
A range of colours could be used, from white to grey, brown, black, blue, pink and purple. Powders were usually made of flour or clay. Louis's wig style evolved over his reign, early styles being shorter and blonde or another pale colour, to later a dark brown and more elaborate style. And more and more people imitated him. Towards the end of Louis's reign, in the late 1600s and early 1700s, wigs had become very large and imposing items. The particular wig style which is associated with Louis, with a central parting, high side peaks and long flowing curls, became a symbol of status and power. These large wigs were heavy, at least three or four pounds in weight, and frequently caused headaches and back pain for their wearers. Charles II, presumably influenced by Louis XIV, also adopted a similar style of wig following his time exiled in France. Some have argued that the hair loss of Louis XIV and Charles II, which spurred on their wig use, was caused by syphilis. There were advantages to wigs over natural hair. You simply shaved off your own hair and then put on a wig cap, which would both soak up your sweat and keep the wig in place. The styling of the hair could take place while you were elsewhere, a definite advantage considering the risk of burning from the hot rollers used. While the Louis copycat wig style began amongst royalty and courtiers, it became popular with lawyers, clergymen, doctors and merchants. The term bigwig stems from this time, when a big wig was a clear indication of social status. And while the best quality wigs might have been made of human hair, it was possible to source a cotton, wool, horsehair or goat hair wig for a much cheaper price. This short clip is courtesy of the Welcome Collection and first aired on BBC Radio Sheffield in 1972. Well, I'm very pleased to say that once again with us in the Walk Right In studio is Frank Roundtree, Sheffield's Health Education Officer. At least I think I'm pleased to say that. One of the first things he said to me today was, uh, love your hairstyle, sort of jokingly. Well, Frank, I do try and wash it as much as possible, but, um, well, probably because it's getting on the longer side. Yeah, well, I wasn't really uh, thinking that you didn't care for your hair. I do like your hairstyle. It's quite surprising over the past few years the way social attitudes have changed towards long hair in men. Of course, it isn't the first time in history that men have had long hair. This is something that seems to go around in cycles, and we seem to be repeating the end of the 19th century cycle and something that we had three and four hundred years ago. Hair is man's crowning glory as well as woman's crowning glory, but only if we look after it. And it's surprising how few people really bother about basic care of the hair, although they will spend an awful lot of money on having a good hairstyle. We are finding a, an emerging problem, actually, at the moment, not just in Sheffield, this is all over the country, and some places are far worse than we are, and this is the re-emerging problem of the head louse. These are rather unpleasant little creatures that most people have come across some time or other. I often ask groups when I meet them, how many of you have had lice as children, and the majority stick their hands up and say, yes, you know, we remember it. But one of the unfortunate things that's happening today is that we're finding a new kind of louse that tends to be resistant to the majority of substances that we used to use in the past. And, you know, if anybody does get a head louse infection, it's important that they do do something about it. And the thing I, I've got to stress is that it isn't only people with long hair that get these things. They can occur, and be, you can get an inf infestation, when you have quite short hair. They don't jump from one person to another. It tends to be when heads have been in close contact. This is one of the reasons why they can rapidly run through a school where you get small children working closely together on desks, perhaps doing a project of one kind or another. And if one child is infected, on they'll go to the next. They can be very difficult to get rid of if they're not treated properly because the louse lays a rather sticky kind of egg onto the surface of the hair and washing with ordinary soap and water and ordinary shampoo doesn't remove these. This is why we have to resort to special substances. We're very glad that at the moment there is something that will attack even the super louse, as it's been called, this one that's resistant. It's available from most chemist shops, a substance malathion, priorderm, and this is extremely effective, but it's got to be used properly according to the directions that one gets on a pack. 
If a parent of a child, or an adult for that matter, finds that they have got an infestation, don't try and hide it. Go and seek advice about it. Go to the chemist, get some of the stuff, and make sure that you get rid of them in your own interest and in the interest of other people. Now, basic hair care like that to make sure that there's no infestation and that you don't leave it unwashed and unkempt and, un and greasy and dandruffy will mean that a long style is perfectly attractive. As somebody said on a television programme not long ago, I'd much rather see not round heads but cavaliers. Long hair is a crowning glory if we care for it. Welcome to Recipes of Yore. We're going to explore some unusual medical recipes from the past. The way in which the word recipes was used in the past is a bit different from how it's used today. So it could mean recipes for cooking, for medicine, or even recipes for cleaning products or cosmetics. Very few of them were treatments we would recognise in the 21st century, and certainly none of these should be tried at home. One particular 1700s recipe book from our college's collections, titled Taylor's Ready Doctor, has a number of hair-related recipes in it. Recipes included treatments for thinning eyebrows, overly brittle hair, and recipes that could cause your hair to curl. One recipe for falling or thinning hair included the burnt ashes of dove's dung, ashes of little frogs burnt, burnt ashes of goat's dung, and laudanum, before saying, quote, The place rubbed over with onions multiplieth the hair. Other ingredients included burnt ashes of goat's hoofs and the burnt ashes of bees. It finishes off with, quote, Wash the head with a dog's urine, and you shall not be bald. Many of the recipes to hinder hair growth were remarkably similar to those designed to encourage it. To remove hair, more burnt ashes were required this time of green frogs. Other recipes advise to, quote, pluck out the hair and anoint the place with the blood of a bat, or anoint the place with the blood of a little frog, or leeches bruised with strong vinegar applied. Dog's milk anointed suffers not hair to grow, and powder of swan's bones put upon anybody's head incontinently causeth the hair to fall. And some of these recipe ingredients appear repeatedly across different books, different decades, even different centuries. There was a consistency in the way hair was treated for hundreds of years, and ingredients such as bat blood, powdered insects and animal dung crop up over and over again. They appear in the early handwritten domestic recipes of women, and the later printed versions of male medical professionals. Caring for the hair wasn't just about making you look attractive, it was viewed as a part of medicine and a part of general body health. The recipes were mostly fairly uncomplicated, though they were often time-consuming to make and, as we've seen, had some fairly unpleasant ingredients. And hair recipes were far from being directed solely or even mainly at women. In addition to cures for baldness, recipe books often contained beard-related treatments, both for too much beard and for too little. One recipe from Taylor's Ready Doctor recommended, quote, To shave often and wash the beard with the boiled juice of sea lions, will cause it to grow very quickly. Or wash with water, wherein rusty iron has been laid, upon the places you want hair to grow. But remember, these cures will not answer the hair on top of the head, cures being given for these, as you may see in this book, being quite different. Now to hinder a beard to grow, or if it be too strong, to make it weaker, singe the beard with the light of a whale oil lamp. Or, if you want to be free of a beard altogether, the blood of a bat, once applied, will do the turn. Thank you for listening to this Case Notes podcast. If you'd like to find out more about the work we do, you can visit our website at rcpe.ac.uk forward slash heritage. You can also find us on Twitter at RCPE Heritage, and we have a Just Giving page. RCPE Heritage linked to on our website if you'd like to support our work and help to fund future podcasts. Thank you.